now. Tonight's presentation of Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills, Suspense. Tonight, the story of two people in the terror that rolled with them. In the city, we called Backseat Driver. So now, starring Miss Vivi Janice and Mr. Parley Bear, here's tonight's suspense play, Backseat Driver. It can't happen to you. You read about stuff like that in the papers. Girls murdered and mutilated. Drunks left dying in the gutter for a handful of change they had in their pockets. Lonesome old men tortured because some hoodlum gets the idea they're misers with a pot of gold hidden under the floorboards of the shack. Sure, you know it's real, but it can't happen to you. Oh, you get your fair share of trouble. I've been a professional man here in Los Angeles for 20 years. I've met up with bums and grifters and petty sharpers. They're around in any business. But the viciousness, the real deep down dirt, that's for somebody else. You do your work and you go home to your family. And for a real bang up evening to break the monotony, you take your wife out to a movie. That's what I did that Saturday night. We'd driven all the way in from the San Fernando Valley to Beverly Hills for a picture Ellie especially wanted to see. Wasn't that a good movie, Joe? Mm-hmm. Just the kind I like. Songs and dancing and girls in pretty clothes. I get so tired of cops and robbers. Well, what's wrong with cops and robbers? Uh, you know what I mean. Murder movies. Honestly, all the policemen are stupid and the crooks are sneering out of the corners of their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The stuff those Hollywood boys stream up. You'd think the streets were knee-deep in blood and you couldn't hear yourself over the machine guns. <laughs> well, here we are, honey. Well, you get in first, honey. Okay. Er, I don't think your door is closed tight, honey. Oh. Oh, don't forget about the gas. Oh, I got plenty to take us out to the valley. I'll fill up at Bill's. Remember how that song goes, Joe? Uh, what song? In the picture. You know, Two on the Moon? The one the boy sang to the girl? Oh, uh, that one. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, heck, I don't know. Oh. Well, we'll hear it again on the radio. Well, say, how about turning it on? The radio? Why, sure. Set her to KNX. We ought to get some news in a few minutes. I'd like to hear whether they caught that fella. That awful mass murderer? Mm-hmm. They spotted him in L.A. this afternoon, but he got away. I know. You told us at supper. Ugh, makes you shiver. Oh, don't worry. He won't get away with it. We left the lights of Beverly Hills behind us as I turned into Coldwater Canyon. It's as quick a way as any to get us across the Hollywood Hills to the valley. It's dark in the canyon, quiet, with mighty little traffic at night. I flipped my lights up full, and we swept up the side of the ridge. The news program came on, but I didn't pay much attention. The fellow was talking about brush fires. They'd already put out the one near my place, though they were still patrolling it. We were over the ridge and sliding down to the valley before the program got to the part I wanted to hear. The latest news on the New Hampshire murderer. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I put it up higher, Ellie. Two weeks ago, Lewis Matcher wiped out an entire family in Greeley, New Hampshire. Today, he was spotted 3,000 miles from the scene of his crime. At 5.30 this afternoon, a patrolman saw and definitely identified Matrick in downtown Los Angeles. However, by darting through heavy traffic at the risk of his life, the killer was once again able to make his escape. According to the neighbors of the slaughtered family, Matrick first appeared in Greeley about a year ago. From fingerprints found in the Noland home, Lewis Matrick has been identified as Lloyd Matthews, ex-convict. He is wanted for questioning in the robbery and murder of a New York storekeeper a year ago. A crime that netted the killer less than $20, Matrick, or Matthews, is 32 years old, height 5 feet 9 inches, weight 155 pounds. He has blue eyes, light brown hair, and a nose that slants to the left. When seen this afternoon, he was wearing a blue suit and gray pork pie hat. He... Awful. Just awful. Not pretty, no. 
somewhere around L.A. this minute. Joe? Hmm? Do you think it's right, us leaving Annie and Bud all alone while we- Oh, now, Ellen. Annie's grown up, and Bud can take care of himself. You can't wrap those kids in cotton wool. I know. <laughs> I'm silly, I guess. Neighbors close all around. All they'd have to do is yell. Joe, what would make a young man do a dreadful thing like that? Uh, could be a lot of things. Maybe he's got a screw loose. Maybe he went nuts over a girl. Maybe he just gets a kick out of killing, like some of them do. Oh, you know all the answers, don't you? <gasps> oh, hey, what the? Joe! Keep going. Go on, keep going. I got a gun here and I'll use it. Now just keep going like this and no tricks. Otherwise, I'm going to blow a hole right through your wife's head. I've had experience in these things. You are li listening to Backseat Driver, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Vivi Janice and Mr. Parley Bear, starring in tonight's production, Backseat Driver, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I drove that car like we were skirting the rim of the Grand Canyon, with nothing between us and the bottom but a mile of country air. This was it. The thing that happens to other people. To the ones that end up on slabs in the morgue. But not to me. Not to Ellie. First car we'd seen since we left traffic down behind us. It passed, but not before the headlights caught our passenger clean in my rearview mirror. He was hunched forward sitting on the edge of the back seat just so we could keep the gun rammed into the nape of Ellie's neck. He had light brown hair, pale eyes, and a nose that slanted. His mouth twitched, jittery. As the car went by, his eyes caught mine in the mirror and flickered. Keep your eyes on the road. Uh, sure, sure. Lose your hat. <laughs> Bright boy, huh? Like I said, you know all the answers. Nah, I didn't lose it. I stuffed it down a drain. Still wearing a blue suit, though. I figured it'd change pretty quick now. Think yours will fit me? You can have the suit! And the car, just let us- Ellen? But, Joe, it's Matrick! Oh, the missus is bright, too! He crawled in here while we were in the movies. Joe, you should have had that car door fixed. You know better. Honey, I, I meant to. I was going to attend to it. Uh, shut up! <laughs> Let's see if you can both be bright enough to keep your trap shut. Turn left to Ventura. Take the slow lane. Don't play no tricks. I've been here before. Okay by me. That's real white of you. Straight out to the open country, Mac. Then I'll take the missus up on that offer. The suit and car. What happens to us? Why, you just walk home. What else? Play it safe and you ain't got a thing to worry about. That was a laugh, that was. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> Once we got out into open country, we didn't have a chance of walking away from that car. All a murderer can hope for is time. He doesn't leave witnesses around to get the law on his tail one second sooner than necessary. All I could do was stall. And pray. And make what feeble gestures I could at Lady Luck. The thing that came into my mind was so risky, it brought my hair up on end. But there was a chance, provided that Trigger Finger didn't start jerking. In the bright lights of the boulevard, I didn't think he'd notice, but a traffic officer would. I turned into Ventura and took the far lane, obedient as a whipped pup. We must have made two or three miles before I heard what I was hoping for. What's that? Hmm? Oh, an ambulance, I guess. We hear a lot of them here in the valley. That ain't no ambulance. It's a motorcycle car! Joe? It's young Mike Kennedy. He patrols this stretch. Oh, look. What are you up to? What are you trying to pull? Nothing. The kid's a friend of ours. Oh, you think you can get me easy, huh? I warned you. I ain't going alone. No, oh, you asked for it. Listen. Listen, will ya? The kid lives near us. Practically grew up under our feet. All he wants is to pass the time of day. Or maybe send a message to our Annie. Yeah? Yeah. 
You start popping now, and we'll all be dead. Keep your shirt on, and I'll get rid of him. Okay. But buddy, better be good. I pulled over to the curb, and Mike came up alongside. He sat balancing the bike between his knees, and the grin on his face was a mile wide. It had worked. At least, we were still alive, and Mike wasn't two feet away. But where do we go from here? I, I had to think, but my brain was wet wool, and my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth. Good evening, sir. Well, what do you know? If it isn't Uncle Joe! <laughs> Something funny, kid? Well, after all the times you read us the riot act about observing the letter of the law... <laughs> oh, brother. Wait till I tell Annie. What's the matter with you, Mike? I didn't notice anything wrong. Oh, hi, Aunt Ellie. Well, nothing much the matter, just Uncle Joe here proceeding steadily out of the boulevard with his headlights up full. Headlights? Oh, by golly, that's right, I... I must have forgotten to dim them. Well, we, we mustn't forget these things. Someday a, a big, bad cop might come along and haul you off to the station. Oh, hello, sir. This is our new neighbor, Mike. Mr. Anderson. Oh, that right? Well, glad to meet you, sir. Hello. I didn't know there were any vacancies out our way. Well, there weren't. Un until recently, uh, Mr. Anderson has taken the Charles's place. The Charles's place? You kidding? No. At last, it looked like things got a little too much for old man Charles. He's clear enough for good. Oh. Kinda sudden, wasn't it? <sighs> yeah, I guess so. Oh, that's it's too bad. For old man Charles, I mean. Oh, mighty nice for you, Mr. Anderson, though. Oh, good places are hard to find these days. All right, Uncle Joe. I'll let you off this time. Give my love to Annie. Uh, Mike? Yes, sir? Watch it. Nothing. Uh, come see us soon, boy. Uh, always glad to have you. Oh, thanks. I'll be around my next night off. I got a date with Annie. Well, so long. <sighs> yeah, that was that. Mike turned his bike and headed back down the boulevard. The chance had come and gone. But it felt to me like half my mind went off with that boy yelling at him. Must have been half a minute before I could pull myself together and ease back into traffic. Nobody said anything. I... I didn't dare to. Neither did Ellie. I couldn't see her, but I could feel herself holding stiff as a ramrod, scared even to turn her head. When two people have lived together as long as we have, each of us knows what the other one's thinking. I went back to driving, and praying. That and cutting my eyes up to the mirror, just in case there might be a white motorcycle eye following us. <laughs> there wasn't, of course. In the back, I knew he was watching, too. Those flickering eyes starting like lightning between us and the rear window. Uh, he was too busy checking to talk. Not that that helped much. Rage and fear were pouring out of him so thick, you could have grabbed a hunk of the atmosphere in your hand. It was queer to drive along like that on the crowded highway. Traffic streaming both ways, lights from drugstores and cocktail joints, and eating houses blazing to the sky and to know if I lifted a finger for help. I'd sign her death warrants. It had to be luck. All luck. There was still a chance I'd get it. The way I'd figured it, we'd started out with just enough gas to get us back to Bill's station. When we hit that, the meter ought to show empty. The gas gauge was hidden from me by the rim of the steering wheel, but I was pretty sure I was right. I waited until I saw the red and green lights above Bill's pumps a block and a half away, and then very slow and easily, I slumped over for a peek at the gauge. I leaned just a little too far. Sit up! Oh, sure. What now? What are you looking at? I was, uh, just easing the crick out of my neck. Yes, you was. You were looking at the dash. You... Uh... 
So that's it, huh? Fresh out of gas. Uh, now, look, I, I just remembered it. Don't give me that. You knew it all along. From now on, you keep your hands on the wheel, Mac. But let me do the driving. Turn into that filling station. Get high test gas, fill her up. Hi, Joe. Evening, Ellie. Hey, Bill. Evening, Bill. Oh, evening, sir. Yeah. Up to the top? Er, uh, yep. Ethel. Ethel is. Here you've been to the pictures. <laughs> uh, yeah. You people know everybody in the whole valley? Well, we've lived here 20 years, back when this was farmland. Of course we know lots of people. Well, I don't like it. Just get five. Get out of here. Oh, uh, make it five, Bill. Okay. Say, what's up to the Mirandas for supper? Oh, uh, that right? Boy, her chili gets better every time. Don't see how it can, but it does. She's saving some for you, you know. Said you'd be around after the show. Oh my. I saw Miranda this afternoon and told her we'd be by for sure, Joe. Well, that'll be a dollar fifty on the nose. A dollar and a half. Uh, here. Uh, thanks, Bill. Well, same to you. What was all that about? Uh, that Miranda stuff? Oh, uh, nothing much. Oh, come on, come on! I gotta ask you everything twice! Miranda runs a drive-in up the road a ways. On show nights, we usually drop in for a carton of chili to take home. I just hope she won't call home when we don't show up and get Annie all worried. Wait a minute. Drive-in, you said? Uh, yeah. And this Miranda could start checking on ya. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. It's just that... She could call your Annie. And between the two of them, they'd have the cops on the lookout for you before midnight, huh? Oh, you're, you're crazy. Oh, like a fox. I ain't kept ahead of the buttons all this time by taking chances. We'll just pick up that chili, Mac. Oh, you want me to go to Miranda's? Why not? Leave Annie to get her beauty sleep. I can cover a lot of ground before tomorrow morning. I ain't eating so good lately. But I could use the food, too. And... With you and the missus to front me, what's to worry about? He was right about that. I went back to driving and praying. Miranda's place was one of those uh, goldfish bowls. Mostly glass, with light pouring out across the space marked for outside service. She saw us pulling up and grabbed a quart carton off the back shelf and hustled to the door. Here you are, Ellie. I was just saying to Betsy, better fix up that chili, Betsy. It's about time Ellie and Joe are showing up. Figuring the distance from Beverly Hills. Oh, who's that in the back seat? I don't seem to recollect your face, young man. Though anybody will tell you, I never forget a face. Well, this is Mr. Anderson, Miranda. He just came out from the east. Oh, is that a fact? Say, Joe, you planning to go straight up Ventura home? Why, sure. Well, don't you do it. Go the back way, even if it does take longer. Of course, that brush fire between here and your place is out, but there's still 50, even 60 men patrolling it. What's that? But that ain't nothing to what's going on further out the valley. That new fire's clean out of control, licking up hundreds of acres. They've been sending truckloads of firefighters past here all evening. Road's blocked for miles, they tell me. The road's blocked? For miles, they tell me. Oh, all them poor ranchers losing their homes. Being from the east, mister, you wouldn't understand, but brush fires is awful things once they get out of control. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, Joe, suppose we start moving, huh? Let's take the back way to your house. To our house? What say? You staying with Ellie and Joe? Yeah, until the road... <laughs> until I can get into my own place. What are we waiting for, Joe? Uh, good night, Miranda. Good night. Well, goodbye. Be sure you come see me, Miss Sanderson. I'll be looking for you.
So there it was. We weren't going to the country. We weren't going to be left to rot at the foot of a cliff, or buried deep in brush. No. We were going home. Home to the kids. And taking a murderer with us. I, I still couldn't see Ellie, but I could feel her tensing up, tight as a pulled drawstring. Mr. Matrick, you didn't mean what you said, did you, about coming home with us? Do you know a better place I can hide out until the road's open? It wouldn't be safe. We've got neighbors close all around if somebody'd see you. Nobody's gonna see me. <laughs> Nobody better. Joe, couldn't we go round the fire? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we could. That would be better. Uh, we could try, at least. There are other roads through the valley. Uh, now, listen, Matrick. We'll nose around and find a way through somehow. Now, cut it out! You heard the old biddy. Hundreds of acres burning. Firefighters, cops, <laughs> get out of the highway. We're going home. No! No, I won't have it! Joe, you stop the car right here! Ah, uh, shut up! You heard me, Joe. I won't have him in my house. Not with Annie and Bud. I said, shut up, Ellen. Stop it, I tell you. It doesn't matter about us. It's the kids. I won't let him touch them. One more word on you, and I'm gonna... No, stop. Ellen, shut up. <laughs> oh, Joe. No. Don't say another thing. I'm... I'm sorry, honey. But Matrix, the boss, we've got to do like he says. <laughs> yeah, that's telling her. Sure, you do like I say, and everything's gonna be rosy. You got no call to worry about the kids. I like kids. As long as nobody gives me the brush off. We'll wake them up as soon as we get home. You and this Annie can fix up a chili supper for us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a picnic. And as soon as the fire's out, we'll all take a trip to the country. <laughs> Another picnic? Huh. You keep going. As long as you're breathing, you keep going. Even when it looks like there's no way out, you hang on by your toenails. We poked up and down those Black Valley streets that twist and turn and sometimes wind up in dead ends. Ellie stopped crying after a while. She slumped down with her head rolling on the seat back, limp as a rag doll with the stuffing leaked out. It took a long time, but it had come to an end. I saw the bulk of a house looming up. There was light sneaking around the edges of the blinds, up in Annie's room. She wasn't asleep after all. She'd been setting up in her bed, maybe plastering red stuff on her fingers and dreaming about the date with Mike. Bud's room was dark. He'd be wrapped in covers like a cocoon and dreaming. <laughs> Whatever boys dream, I, I couldn't remember. I pulled up to the concrete walk I'd poured with my own hands before there was any Annie or Bud, and then I cut the lights. In a second or two, my eyes got used to the dark. I could make out the high hedge Ellie planted around the place and a roof rising up beyond it. Out, missus. Face the house. Now you, Mac. Slide on the same side. Stand beside her. All right. Walk to the door. Slow. No funny business. I'm right behind you. Look out, Joe! Get down, Ellie! Oh, I'll kill you! I'll kill you! Hold him, boys! It's okay, Mike. I've got him. Are you all right, Uncle Joe? On Ellie? Ellie? Ellie, you all right? All right, indeed. Smack flat on my face on a concrete walk and you've fallen on me. Oh, oh there's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> That's my girl. Well, just don't stand there. Help me up. Oh, here. <clears throat> there we are. Got to get in the house before the kids come bustling out here. I won't have them mixed up in this. Well... How's he doing, boy? Oh, I got him through the gun hand and the right shoulder, see? A lucky shot, cop. If you weren't lucky, oh, you'd all be cold meat by now. Oh, oh maybe. Oh, Matrick, isn't it, Uncle Joe? 
That's him. Miranda described him to you? Mm-hmm. Well, if that old girl doesn't miss a trick. We even knew you were taking the back way home. Oh, you left a clear trail, Uncle Joe. Well, that's slick work. I had to get him out of the car before the fireworks started. Ellie didn't stand a chance. She helped, though. Ellie catches on quick. Oh, I'll bet. Mean guy like Matrick? You make him think you don't want to do something, and he'll break his neck doing it. I let on on how I was trying to run out of gas. That got us to Bill's. Then we both made out there was no sense going to Miranda's. So we get bold into going to Miranda's. It was a thousand to one she'd run off at the mouth about brush fires and scare him into hiding out. After that, all Ellie had to do was turn on the hysterics and he was dead set on coming here. Yeah, yeah. Right boy, like I said. <laughs> right enough. You did all right too, Mike. I was watching the rearview mirror all the time, and you were trailing us, but you never showed. Oh, but you knew I was there, though. When one officer starts double-talking another officer, he wants to know why. <laughs> what officer? What double-talk? You never said a thing to him except that I bought some place out here. Well, yeah, the Charles's place. <laughs> oh, yep. Poor old man Charles. In a tough spot. Moving out for good. What's wrong with that? Matrick, didn't anybody ever tell you it wasn't smart to take up with strangers? Uh, maybe I'd better introduce myself. My name's Charles. Joe Charles. Detective. Homicide. Tonight I was off duty. Just taking my wife to a movie. Suspense in which Mr. Parley Bear and Miss Vivi Janice starred in tonight's presentation of Backseat Driver. Next week, the story of twin identities in crime. It is based upon fact. We call it The Greatest Thief in the World. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Anthony Willis. Tonight's script was written by Miss Sally Thorson. The music was composed by Renee Jarenik and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Larry Thor, Tony Barrett, Jack Edwards, Joe Crankston, and Helen Cleave. The star's address is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>